Hello and welcome to Talk Seagulls and we're back after a Brighton win and I tell you what, we are absolutely flying at the moment. In terms of results anyway, there's so much to talk about but just after speaking to you, by the way, Toby, yep. um, about low blocks and about how we struggle with it so much and about how, it's, how difficult it is, that guy Welbs, the man in form at the moment, proved everything as to why they are so effective the other day yep. and... It's made my week start a little bit better, although it's a very tired one. I'm sure everyone at home is probably just as tired if you made the long trip up and long trip down. Um, but yeah, Toby, what did you think of that? It was a different Brighton that we saw against Newcastle, but an effective one. Yeah, it was different. They must have listened to the, uh, the podcast. But, <laughs> it must have um, done. No, it, it was a very different different one. And I, I really liked it, actually. I think it sort of showed that the, the manager can, can whip these sort of things out and change the style a little bit because obviously the way Brighton have been, it's not predictable, but everyone goes, right, they play this way and they're, good at it but it's sort of shown that they can actually now pull a little bit of a rabbit out of the hat and, yeah. and change the game a little bit and it it worked perfectly yeah really it's, it's, it's worked perfectly like people call it a little like smash and grab in a way but it's that's the game plan it's worked smash and grab and hove albions i think is what i said <laughs> um which i didn't think i'd say about us for probably ever I, yeah. I, we'd never have done that I, yeah. I don't even know a time the last time we'd done that yeah. um prime hewton boy gave me you know yeah, but to be to be a top club, you have to sort of have them games where it is a little bit of a smash and grab. You defend really well, and then when you get the chance, you take it, mm. and and it's worked. And yeah, like you say, you're absolutely flying. And I think that's also it's going to scare a lot of teams because they go, actually, hold on a minute, what Brighton's going to turn up today? Mm. So it, it actually is going to benefit you even more going into games. Yeah, I agree. And, and before I get into sort of the main part of the game, obviously. There's, there isn't too much for us in terms of chances to talk about. Yeah. Um, but before I get into sort of the goal for the game, as you say, it is that changing style. And I remember talking to you, talking to many other fans as well. The the biggest sort of reservation we had about Fabian Hertzler was that high line, mm -hmm. was whether we can have a plan B, whether we could maybe change things up a little bit. Um, there's changing things up a little bit and maybe going a little bit conservative. I thought maybe dropping the line back a little bit, but still trying to play yeah. through defence. But... Do you know what? In that first 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, I don't even think we tried to play out from the back properly. I think it was mostly just a long ball, yeah. which, again, I don't recall many times we've even taken a goal kick long, um, yeah. let alone playing a long ball from defence in midfield. And we're almost trying to lump it up to either Ferguson or Welbeck. And obviously that's how the goal came about. Yeah. But, I mean, as, as effective as it as it was for us on the day... I mean, do you think that that's a pretty appropriate, you know, plan B for us to have is is the long ball up to a big man like Danny Welbeck? Yeah, I think he, he obviously would have looked at Newcastle and he would have looked at their strengths and their weaknesses. And obviously they have a lot of pace up front and their press instructor is superb Like with, with Gordon and the, like, the pace they have is frightening. Mm. So if you're trying to play out and Newcastle have, obviously they haven't, their press isn't perfect, but their press is probably one of the best in the league. So you go, actually... There's no point us playing to their strengths. We're just going to avoid that press and just go long. And lucky in a way that you do have two strikers that are physical mm. and win the ball and make sure that you get the first contact ready for the second ball. I think that was so important. And, and Welbeck and uh, Evan done that superbly well. Obviously, mm. they're, they're very physical and they know how to use their body well. Um, which there's no point in them just being big and they're just running all over the gaff. They, mm. they use their body effectively. And then you've got your midfielders that can then step in and your wingers as well that step in and win the second mm. ball. And all of a sudden, their press is out of the game. Yeah. Newcastle probably going, oh my God, <laughs> no, what, what do we do? Do we drop? And then all of a sudden, if they drop, then you'll just end up playing out. Mm. So it's actually good that you have both styles because then, again, it makes Newcastle think. It'll make other teams think when you go and play. And it's like, right, what well, Brighton's going to turn up today. Yeah. I mean, there's two, pe there's two things you mentioned there. One was Ferguson, who got quite a lot of stick from Brighton mm -hmm. fans. I mean, particularly them around me, probably in the stands, but then also probably on, online as a few as well. Maybe questioning him. I, I don't agree with it at all, to be honest with you. I think Ferguson's still an, an elite talent. I think he'll go on to be um, one of the best strikers we've had here. I think he's a very clinical forward. Um, but I do think maybe the, the sort of the long ball thing maybe just exposed him a little bit in the mm -hmm. sense of maybe he hasn't got back to strength as much as he probably had when he was breaking yeah. through. Obviously, he was so physically dominant before. Um, I think his injury maybe has hampered his physicality just a little bit. Um, although with that being said, it was a lot, lot better, I thought, against Newcastle. Yeah. Um, but do you think maybe that's, it's a bit harsh really to, to dig out Ferguson because realistically he's doing what he's told to do and yeah. that's to just hold his man off and try and knock it onto either Welbeck or Jorginho to run yeah. onto. Um, and that's all he could really do. And at the end of the day, 
you know, they're a very, very physical back line as well at Newcastle. Yeah. It's not easy to get around the no. likes of Dan Byrne, et cetera. So, you know, what, what, what do you make of sort of Ferguson's performance, but also Ferguson as a player? He, he was, he was, he's bound to get better, isn't he? Oh, 100%. And it's always difficult when you're a striker. The last thing you just want to do is have your back to goal. Yeah. You want to be making runs forward. You want to be having shots. But for the, the mm. way sort of the manager wanted to play that game, he, he sort of just had to do his job and sort of try and be effective. And it's so difficult when you're coming up against them defenders and look at the size of them. Like they're, yeah. they are, they're giants. And obviously Evan's still really young. Um, but at the same time, Evan's physical. And I think he, he got himself about quite well. And he, yeah. he, he tried to do his job well and, and effectively. And at the end of the day, you, you've won the game. So it's not like he hasn't had an impact at all because you, you still won the game of football. So, yeah, it, it's, it's difficult. And obviously people are going to want to demand goals. He's like, he's a striker, he wants goals. But if you're winning games and he's done his job effectively, he's helped the team win. Mm. So at the same time, it, it's sort of that argument from a, a Liverpool um, perspective when Firmino wasn't really scoring goals. I was like, okay, yeah, Firmino's not scoring goals, but he's creating space for other people too, or he's holding up well and he, he's... He's assisting and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I think if, if he's doing his job well, see, everyone wants to see goals. Strikers yeah. are judged on goals, but he's doing his role well. Um, and if he's asked to hold the ball up and be his physical, it might not be what he wants to do, but he's going to do whatever he can mm. to stay in the team and to please the manager. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I thought, again, I didn't think there was too much to really take away. Um, because as you say, it's, it's, he's doing what he's told to do at the end of the day, that he's told to get up there and sort of hold that ball up. And that's, even if it's not always going to work, obviously you can't do that 100 times out of 100. Um, but I, I thought he did a, a fair job. And obviously say you, you have sort of the supporting players up front at Brighton. Now we're, we're so stacked up front. We've never really had this situation. We've got yeah. so much talent and not even all of that talent is on the pitch. We've got such a good bench, but yeah. and as well, the players that are injured and also, yes. you know, the, the squad, it, it is fantastic at the moment. I think it's probably the, the strongest personnel squad I've seen at Brighton mm -hmm. in, the, in ever, probably. Um, but one, one thing you mentioned is wingers. And actually, this is the biggest question mark that I had going into this game was I actually quite liked the idea of it. I thought, okay, we've stacked the midfield. It looks like we've got a lot of sort of more dominant players um, trying to, you know, sort of counter Newcastle. Newcastle, as you said rightly, they've got probably one of the better midfields in the league, yeah. especially personnel-wise. Yeah. Um, you don't even need to go through them to know how good they are. Um, but to counter that, we did that really well. The actual winger's point of view, obviously Minte and mm -hmm. Mitoma are both not available, or yeah. Simon Adingra. And I was thinking, okay, he's not even put Gruder in there. He's actually just gone with, was it Jorginho, Welbeck, Ferguson? Yeah. Um, and I thought, okay, interesting. I wonder how he's going to go about this one. Because it was almost like he pushed them wide, but he didn't completely push them wide enough. Yeah. Um, I think Jorginho was the widest out of a lot of them. And he did that job superbly. I mm -hmm. thought he was absolutely immense. I thought after the game that he had against Spurs the one game he needed to come back into was going to a big club away from home at a big yeah. ground. That's It's going to be, you know, notoriously going to St. James's Park is yeah. probably one of the toughest places to go and get any points. Um, but I thought Jorginho was probably my standout as well as Welbeck because of his sort of width that he took up. It's not what you probably would associate him with. You'd, yeah. you'd fancy him sort of more centrally. Um, but I thought he did it very, very well. And he's, he's proven that £40 million pounds, um, seems like a bit of a bargain at the moment. Yeah, no, he he was superb. And I think it showed that he can add different things to his game, which is, is wonderful to see. Um, yeah, he obviously a bit wider. Um, and yeah, it was one of them where I think it's sort of a little bit lopsided in a way, mm. sort of played that sort of lopsided, which is which is fine. But obviously with the, the Welbeck um, and Evan, but it's effective because the fullbacks as well, it means they can sort of push on and sort of when the, the defenders sort of rotate as well, sort of in possession, it might look like a four, but then out of possession, it's a three. Mm. So it, it sort of allowed that sort of freedom for a little bit more rotation. So then again, it makes Newcastle guess. I think I think that was the beauty of, of Brighton at the weekend is Newcastle didn't really know what, mm. what Brighton were actually doing, mm. which th there's a beauty in that. Um, so I think it, it it was very effective and he was he was brilliant. And I think that probably would have been the plan from the beginning of the week because I don't think it's you just go in and play it. It's, you go on the Thursday, oh, they're not available, right, you're just going to do that. I think he probably would have been aware of this going into the week and probably would have done lots of meetings around it to make sure he performs to the best level and it's worked mm. very well. Yeah, it did, it did. And I think this is the thing for me is, is Hudson deserves a lot of praise here. Um, because of the way we did it, the way the sort of goal come about, we soaked up a lot of pressure. Yeah. And the Brighton of old, 
absorbing pressure, but also taking shots against us. Historically, we normally would give in. And and I think the, the Brighton that I would always have in my head was we're a bit bottler. We've always had the sort of mm. bottler mentality in my head. And going into a game like Newcastle, Anthony Gordon, I thought, um, as much as he had a decent first sort of 10, 15 minutes, I thought we locked him up really well. Yeah, kept him quiet. Um, Joel Veltman's obviously so good at doing that <laughs> sort of that sort of yeah. role and being that bit of a wind up. Yasin Yari was also doing a, a bit of similar, just yeah. you know, a few little taps on the shoulder, he's going to go down. And this is the dark arts of football, right? Yeah. Um, I think that we've seen more of that from this Hurts this Brian. We've seen a bit more of a, you know, maybe a bit more of a conservative role, um, you know, cheating at times probably as well the it. ugly side of football like I said the dark arts of football which is actually so important if you, if you mm. get it right it makes such a big difference so yeah show, I think that's a, that's a mentality thing which Hurts has clearly put into the squad it's like right we're no longer nicey nicey bright anymore we're, we're going to be there and people are going to be scared of us I think mm. he's tried to bring that to the club the mm. Bruggen by the way yeah. I mean as a goalkeeper yourself yeah. seeing the Bruggen make the saves that he did I mean he got a few question marks from I, I think it was fair at the time. He did kick yeah. the ball out of play a, a fair amount of times in the first game, in the first half. And I thought, you know, as much as he didn't really need to make too many saves, you probably yeah. wouldn't have noticed him too much. The only thing you could really remember was him sort of lumping it long and then not really winning anything. And it was frustrating me. I hated the long ball yeah. thing. I was thinking, what are we doing? With what you know, what is this? Until I realised actually, I think this might be the game plan now. I think there is a reasoning behind it. Um, Verbruggen made some massive saves and he got the, pl the player uh, man of the match um, on the club's account mm -hmm. um, I think pretty much fair enough I, I, when I look at the rest of the squad I think fair enough um, those saves he was making Toby to, to do that in a, in a big game away from home you know where the, where the fans are difficult as well you know if, if, that, if one of them goals goes in the momentum's going to change the game changes yeah um, but he kept it and it was, it was on him a lot of times yeah. um, 21 year old goalkeeper doing that is, is you know, it's, it's no stretch, is it? Yeah, it's going to give him bags of confidence and hopefully as, as Bright fans, you're going to see him push on and have more of them performances um, because I think he probably, in a Brighton shirt, probably hasn't had a game like that no. where he's had to make lots of saves. He's had to make saves, but he's never had a game where people go on, actually, he's made, a big, on yes, him, yeah. he's made a big difference in this game by keeping us in it. Um, so yeah, I think that should just give him more confidence and obviously you probably don't want to see more of the performances because <laughs> at the same time you want to be dominating games. Yeah. But at the same time, you know you can rely on him because he, he's had games. Now he obviously had that game at Newcastle and that will just do him the world of good. Yeah. He's still so young and to now have that performance so you can go, actually, look, I've shown the Brighton fans and I've shown Premier League fans, actually, I'm I'm here and this is why he's chosen me as a number one because mm. probably people probably would have questioned going, have to, has he made the right choice? Because... Um, Stilly was was fantastic. Has yeah. been fantastic, and with the ball at his feet, obviously Stilly's probably better um, mm. and probably understands the game a bit better. But obviously that comes of age. But I think now it sort of shows why he's chosen him as his number one, and mm. he's only going to get better. I think that's it. he's only going to get better, and he's he's a goalkeeper for years to come. Mm. And the confidence will be all round. It won't just be a shot stopping now. He'll be more confident when he gets on the ball. So I think. As, as Brighton fans should be really excited about yeah. it because it's only going to do in the world of good and he's he's only going to kick on even more now. Yeah, I, I mean, as you can tell me this from a goalkeeper's perspective, but mm. they say like a defender, when he when they put in a, yeah. a last-ditch challenge, it feels like a goal. Yeah. And I think some of them saves will feel like a goal to him, even if he maybe didn't yeah. show it in the moment. I think when he looks back on that game, you know, they were difficult chances. I mean, the majority of time, in my memory anyway, if a team broke up, broke out against this one on one, mm. I'm I'm accepting defeat. I'm sort of going, yeah. ah, do you know what? Fair enough, right? They've yeah. scored. And with Verbruggen, I didn't actually feel that too often, mm. um, which was surprising because as much as this this kid is is a wonder kid, really yeah. in the in the grand scheme of football, um, you know, he got to the Euro semi final, wasn't yeah. it for for his nation, which is an unbelievable achievement for such a young age to be number one and and guide them that far. He yeah. made some big saves in his in his tournament. It was a shame that Ollie Watkins had to beat him, but we we're <laughs> we we're happy about that one. Yeah. Um, but again, he he was there for them. He he sort of. As you say, we probably haven't seen it for us. Um, yeah. That phrase, saving, will feel like a goal. Do you, do, does that feel the same for you when you have a good game, when you make a good save? Do yeah. you look back on it and, and think, that's given me that boost that I needed? Oh, 100%. And they were, they were big saves as well. They're not just saves which he's expected to make. Yeah, there's, mm. there's a few he's expected to make. But they're, they're big saves and they're, they're, they're very key moments in the game. It's, if you make them saves and you've, you've maybe won 4 5 nil 
people don't probably really look back on it and go, oh, that was important. But it's because mm. you've won one nil, he's kept a clean sheet and he's made big saves. That just, the confidence it gives you is crazy. Yeah. Um, and people go, oh, but now there's pressure on him to perform like this every week. I'm like, hmm. I don't think so. I think it only it only will do in the world of good because he'll always look back on this performance and be like, right, that's the level. And I can always, and I think he'll achieve more, but that's his level. And mm -hmm. he'll obviously expect that of him every week. But like I said, you're not going to have games where you're, you're going to be conceding lots of chances every week. Um, so I think that that's the next thing is you might have two, three games now where you're dominating the ball and he only has to make one save. And or sometimes as a goalkeeper, which can be, brutal is you don't make a save yet you concede yeah. a goal because you, you might have only conceded one chance yeah, a game and like Newcastle that, yeah. you have the one one chance against you and they score and as a goalkeeper you're like I've got yeah. no impact here whatsoever yeah. and the only thing I've done is pick the ball out of my net yeah so that that's that's where it can it can flip yeah can that sort of change the trajectory of the game you know you sort of mm. that one chance if it does go into the back of the net you're sort of thinking right okay so that that one was potentially on me you know, can, can that change the way your sort of mentality goes especially if it's an early goal as yeah. I say an early goal is the best time to score right yeah. it, it knocks the confidence back mm -hmm. uh, you know you conceded an early goal didn't you this weekend does this it, weekend, does it yeah. change the way that, that game went for you or, or, or does it change is it one where you just think no get out of your head as quickly as possible and, and restart as if it's not it can it can do both ways because I know lots of goalkeepers going to right I don't want to concede I don't want to concede mm. and you have that pressure of not wanting to concede and if you concede an early goal that pressure's gone so you sort of play with a bit of freedom okay um, but at the same time it's like if if you're playing against a team of low block and you concede after five minutes you're not involved with the game mm. really that much and like tiny little impacts and that is life as a goalkeeper it's little moments but yeah if you go even after a game like if all you've done is conceded goals or obviously you passed it back a little bit if you haven't really had to make any saves you, you're just like mm. it's so frustrating and sometimes the goal's not even your fault you yeah. just uh, a lot of the time it's a great finish there's nothing you can do about it but you just you want to have an impact on the game and it's so difficult mm. especially when you play for size that just want to keep the ball and play and up the pitch as well because yeah, like I say you don't really have that much of an impact yeah well it's what people remember as well as fans yeah. you know if, if you concede a goal, they're going to remember you conceding yeah. the goal. You could have made three great saves before then, but if mm -hmm. you sort of fumble one, as you see yesterday with Crystal Palace, which is quite funny to bring that up after, yeah. <laughs> you know, we, it's always great for yeah. us watching Crystal Palace concede goals, but, you know, it's taken so quickly from yeah. Chris Wood. Um, it's hit hard, it's a hit low, but still yeah. Henderson will be looking at that thinking, my God, I should have not let that go in. But yeah. again, it's it's moments like that that everyone will remember, and you'll yeah. always look at that game of Henderson making that mistake. Not to say he was having a great game anyway, but... Yeah, it's one that again he's going to remember and that. Everyone the fans remember, remember yeah, that. everyone remembers it. And no matter whether he's he's made two, three good saves before, or he's had no impact. That that's the only bit that people remember, and and mm -hmm. that's the sort of the bit people judge. And obviously, we talk a little bit like about it now. I see um, Robert Sanchez at Chelsea. Yeah, um, yeah, he got being, a bit, he got a hard time in this weekend. He got he gets a hard time, but then you go like some of the performances he's had this season for Chelsea mm -hmm. have been unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. He, he's done things which he, he's made mistakes, and it, it's probably the fact it's made probably a bit too many mistakes probably for his liking or maybe gives the ball away a bit too much for his liking but at the same time he's also had some like crazy performances so it's being a goalkeeper is so difficult because all of a sudden you do one thing and then that's it everyone is just like it's, it's, it's on you especially from a fan perspective mm -hmm. at that such elite level people people do get onto you and they sort of forget the the last few weeks because Dean, Dean Henderson to, to be fair to him this season so he hadn't, he hadn't played for a while beforehand but I think he's he's performed pretty well in a Palace shirt and he, playing for England the other day as well. I think I think he's he's performing well and he's probably getting back to the level which is at when he's at Man United. People forget that he didn't play for a, a long period of time as a goalkeeper. It's quite hard to then get back up to the level and, and get a run because you're you're not that heavily involved. It's different mm. if you're a midfielder. You can get on the ball, you can demand it, you can do things. As a goalkeeper, you're actually relying a little bit on the opposition. Yeah. And, for you to actually have, to have that impact and get your confidence back. Yeah, no, so that's where it's harder. I, I completely get what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I'm going to show you a clip that um, Matty sent me, my friend from Newcastle Powell, from, I think it was Magpie's channel or something like that. Mm. I'm really sorry if I've got the name wrong, but I probably have. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like him anyway. He's a good lad, is Matty. He sent me a video that's going to be on the intro, so I hope you like that one, by the way. Um, I'm going to show you it now. And his, basically, his opinion on the game. Well, I think Ryan and other Brighton fans lured me into a false sense of security, to be honest, because I was expecting Fabian Hirst to be open. I was expecting, or maybe I was more so hoping for a high line like we saw at Chelsea. But 
this was very different. This was shut up shop. This was snatch and grab Albion and fair play to you. He executed that plan very, very well. And we were talking about Danny Welbeck prior to the game. And oh my God, that, that bloke's aging like a fine wine. Absolutely ridiculous. Obviously, shame to see him come off for you lot in the end. They're injured. Hope he's all right and back to playing soon because he's in the, literally the form of his life. Ridiculous goal scoring start of the season for that guy, Welbs. But um, listen, Newcastle started the game very well. What a very good opening 30 35 minutes, created enough chances to be 2 3 0 up. You could tell Alexander Izak had been suffering with a broken toe and he'd been missing for a few weeks because his sharpness wasn't there. Anthony Gordon knows what a one on one that comes to mind and seems to be one of those days where we didn't take our chances and he gets sucker punched and, and punished at the other end and that, that can happen week in, week out in the Premier League to be honest but no excuses from us. I think Brighton did well, defended well, keep, I made some good saves and when you look at it, you think Newcastle didn't do enough in the second half. To be honest, first half very good but second half we didn't click, we didn't create and the substitutes had very little and no impact so frustrating day at the office for Newcastle and congratulations to Brighton for that win there. Deserved it. The travelling fans were very good. Good numbers there for the length of the country derby, as Ryan likes to call it. <laughs> and uh, that massive journey home, I'm sure, was a lot better with three points in the bag. Top man's Matty, by the way, but also, why is he so out of breath? <laughs> <laughs> he's, he, he sounds must be like he's walk. struggling. <laughs> um, by the way, I like the phone case, just saying, if you want to get one link in the bio. Um, but no, um, top. Uh, very very good analysis mm. to be honest of the game in a couple of minutes um, it's interesting to see he, one he mentioned the same as that Verbruggen's yep. made um, it was nice for him to mention the fact that he hopes Danny Welbeck gets better soon I yep. think I think he will be okay I think it's a general Probably gauge a yeah, yeah I think he's alright um, we hope Danny if you see yeah. this mate please say you're alright in the comments not that you ever do that um, <laughs> but no we're, we're, I think we're he's right after that goal I mean Newcastle did do very well there's a lot of saves made as you rightly said and then it was that long ball up to Welbeck. And this is the bit that we needed to get to because at this point, it was just shortly after, in my, I actually shouted saying, stop playing the long ball, it's not working. And someone else said to me, that's the game plan, shut up, in other words, in nicer words than that. And I was like, okay, I'll hear it out. And then actually it was that ball up and it was just a little chest down, wasn't it? A little knock with Jorginho, beautiful weighted pass, but then it's a strength from Welbeck to sort of hold off two men, like they're yeah. not even there. And then he's just passed it past the goalkeeper. He's never going to sort of save that one. Um, it's, it's nicely tucked into the corner. Um, but it was that moment of, one, on the fans' point of view, absolute disbelief that that's even happened because I thought, my God, we don't deserve this at all. I was getting ready to say what we're doing again at half time. I remember so many times he sort of started quite slowly, haven't we, this season. And I was thinking, please don't do this again. But it was that moment where we just broke the ice and it was so rare to see that from a Brighton team. Um, but it was Welbeck again, it, it, firing his way through, absolute powerhouse. Um, you spoke sort of highly of Danny as a, as a person. I can probably agree with you. Um, he's now pushing that legend status at Brighton. He yeah. really is. I mean, if he's not there already, I mean, he's, he's getting very, very close. Yeah. It's what now, he's got to be four goals away. I think three goals away from being probably, our all-time yeah, scorer. Yeah. Five goals already in the Premier League, an assist as well to add to that. He could have even had a couple more if he wanted to. Yeah. Um, you on Danny Welbeck, what do you think? <laughs> no, I, obviously he, he put it put it very well. Aging like a fine wine. Um, mm, the finest. Yeah, he, he's, Danny clearly, Malbec. He's, clearly looking, yeah, he's clearly looking after himself very well. Very, very well. Um, and it, it, it's shown with his, his performances. Obviously, uh, a big worry for Brighton fans when he was coming in was his, was his injuries and be like, right, how many games are you going to get out of him a season? But he's clearly working very, very, very hard physically, yeah. uh, mentally as well, to just keep pushing and keep wanting it. He's been playing for what, how many years now? And he's yeah. been at some big clubs. And yeah, it, he is he is aging like a fine wine. And I mm. think that just comes from him looking after himself and knowing he, he knows what he's good at. We, we spoke mm. about that. He knows what he's good at. He's, he's strong. He's powerful. And then he, he, you get, get him in the box and... He's going to finish. Yeah, his, his, his finishing is his top draw, and he's he's proven that this season. So yeah, I think it, it all it all stems from his from his character. Like I said, to you, he's he's such a lovely guy. He, he's played at big clubs. He, he's probably if anyone has the right to act a bit big time or anything like that, he, he probably does. But he, he's not that guy at all. He is mm. he's so lovely. He's so down to earth. And yeah, he he's clearly still has that 
passion and that that energy to and the want to just keep going um and yeah he's, he's clearly like i said he's worked very hard on, mm. on keeping himself fit and and staying strong there's no point in him just being available for games because the type of player he is he needs to be strong he needs to be powerful um so he's, he's kept that up plus also staying fit touch wood this yeah. season and, and doing Things really really well <laughs> yeah so yeah he's He's clearly he's clearly worked very hard and yeah aging like a fine wine. Yeah, no, I'm I'm totally with you. I mean, he's just he's just a class act on and off the pitch. I've said it so many times about Welbeck, but I think he deserves his praise every single time I say it. To be honest, he, he seems to just keep proving it on the pitch every yeah. week, and it, it's a it's a different performance again. As we said, it's it's not the same sort of Brighton that we expected, but still Welbeck's there. Um, probably that clinical nature that he's showing now, as you say, yeah. he's, he's he's finding the back of the net with most of his shots. That actually wasn't really a common theme for Welbeck beforehand. I mean, mm. when he was sort of at Watford, when he was at Arsenal and Manchester United, he, he always sort of struggled with being that clinical forward. And I think maybe that's why he didn't stay up there with, with the injury, yeah. sort of just knocked him down that peg. Yeah, and yeah. I think that that for confidence, if you, if you were to put it in his shoes, you can imagine you, you sort of go from being the kid at Manchester United yeah. to sort of not really working out at Arsenal, then it's Watford yeah. and then you're sort of a free agent. So, you know, from his point of view to come here and, and almost just shoot above and beyond all of that. Yeah. And and yeah, if it wasn't for his injuries, he'd probably play him for a, a, a very big club for a long mm. time. I think he'd have yeah, been a, yeah. a Champions League footballer, to be honest, if he yeah. stayed fit. Um, but he, he just, we just seem to get the best out of him. And actually just talking what Matty said on that second half, Newcastle, they didn't really do much. And no. I think actually this was the part where everything changed for me. And I thought, this is really good stuff. Yeah. And I remember thinking, okay, we're showing we can do this now. We're sort of playing the ball a little bit whilst sort of keeping that rigid structure. And it was so easy for us in the, in the past. I was, so, I was so, so expecting for him to come back. In my head, I was just thinking, I'm just, just waiting, waiting for that for one. Or, yeah. I'm waiting for the two one. I know yeah. it's going to happen. It's even bringing on Harvey Barnes. Except, you know, yeah, you're thinking yeah, yeah. one of them's got a score. Yeah. It didn't come. And again, credit to Bart, credit to the defence. Um, but I think there was, it was a bit more than that. It felt like the team were just strong and quite resolute and even mm. when we were taking them counter-attacking opportunities i think when we brought on purvis as yep. um and Karim Matoma, mm -hmm. you saw a different dynamic again yep. you saw a different outlet and again it was a it was a sign that fabian hurts is changing it at the right times maybe mm. putting on the right different substitutions that yep. we probably wouldn't usually have done it's a different style but it's, it's working really really well and we showed something different again in the second half yeah and uh, he as he said Newcastle didn't really create a lot and that they struggled to create chances. I'm actually going to, instead of putting it down on Newcastle, I'll praise Brighton for that. I think Brighton have actually stopped them. If, and like I said, they've really frustrated them. And that's full credit to Brighton. They've, they've stopped a team with a lot of talent because Newcastle have a lot of talent and limited them with chances and actually made them look a bit poor. Mm. And, and, that, and that's what happens when we spoke about the low block. You get really frustrated. Um, so the Newcastle players would have just got frustrated, would have got a bit bored, probably trying things that they don't normally do. And yeah, Brighton have, have done that so well. Yeah, obviously they had a few chances, but yeah, they didn't create. It was a mostly lot the first half, half, wasn't it? I mean, they didn't yeah. really create a lot second half, and that's again because Brighton changed it around a little bit, so mm. it just kept Newcastle guessing. Like the mm. players would have been on the pitch looking at Eddie Howe, going, "Gaffer, like, what are we doing? <laughs> like, this isn't yeah. this isn't the Brighton we've been watching the last few weeks, and mm. this isn't the Brighton in the first half. They changed it around the second half, so it, it, they just really frustrated Newcastle. And from a Newcastle fan, you can imagine watching it, you probably losing your head going what on earth is going on and yeah. even from a bright perspective like you said you're like you're just shocked yeah everyone is shocked. the only people that wouldn't have been shocked by that is the brighton players and the manager yeah because they they would have known this throughout the whole week they're the only ones who wouldn't have been shocked they would yeah. have walked away with a little smirk on their face going yeah we've, we've done them here yeah and, and the game plans worked yeah it's, it's one very satisfying yeah. for for players fans staff coach everyone right if I, I can imagine that feeling is very sweet um, but you're right, it was a bit of a feeling of shock, maybe. Yeah. Because, you know, you sort of have the feeling, oh, I think we'll go to Newcastle, get a win, that'd be great. Yeah. Go, you know, go all the way out the country. Um, and credit to Matty for being so sort of transparent with it. Yeah. He wasn't he wasn't sort of bitter. No, um, no, he, right. he seemed quite all right about it. And, and I like that, you know. Um, and I think, yeah, as you say, the game plan did work. And going into a game a bit like Wolves, this is where things change, right? Yeah. And this is where I'm a little bit not so sure because... Coming up against Wolves is not an easy task. And no. the reason I say that is not because Wolves historically have been a decent team, um, but it's more because they're bottom of the league. Yeah. And coming up against bottom of the league, when their only point this season has come against Manchester City, I'm thinking, when's their first three going to come? Yeah. And when they come against the team that they play six times a year at Brighton, yeah. we seem to play them cup, home and yeah. away, <laughs> replay, you'd name it. We'd probably play Wolves eight times yeah. a week. But 
here we go again. We're playing Wolves. And this is the one where I'm maybe not so sure because we're now the favourites. We're yeah. now the fifth in the league. We're now the ones that need chasing. You know, we're not sort of, you know, I think we, we quite rightly have the um, the aura of being the favourites here because we've spent yeah, so much money. We've yeah, got the course, better yeah, players. Yeah. Um, in theory, we've got sort of a, a better setup than Wolves, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I, I'm still not quite sure, you know, because it's because mm. it's so new yeah. and because this system's so new, yeah. I've not seen Brighton low block somebody, but I've not seen Brighton counter-attack for a long time, not since we had Hewton in charge. Yeah. I've not seen a sort of, sort of been that rigid team. It's, it's just not Brighton to me. Yeah. Um, and that's not to say it can't be, and that's not to say we can't do a bit of a balance of both, because I can imagine when we've got these players coming back, Matt O'Reilly, et cetera, yeah. we're going to be looking good. Joao Pedro too. Um, <sighs> Wolves. Yeah, I think he, he'll probably change the style. I don't think he's going to play the same style as you've done at Newcastle. Um, I think he's probably going to go in with that bit more dominant, going to go, right, actually, we are the favourites, because let's be honest here, Wolves are probably going to sit off and probably try and counter-attack. So I think you'll go in with a different style. He'll use the players uh, of what he's got. Obviously, he'd like to have that Chao Pedro and, and people like that, but he'll, he'll use the players that he's got. And I think you'll probably see a little bit more of that typical Brighton of probably playing and working your way up the pitch because Wolves probably will sit off. But yeah, I think it should be quite an exciting game. Obviously, Wolves shown at the weekend against Man City that they can defend and they can defend well. Obviously, that goal, people go, is a little bit, can be a bit controversial, but mm. it's right at the end. So it, it sort of shows that Wolves... So they didn't get a point against City, did they? They, they drew yeah, so, yeah, they, um, they won in the last Yeah. Game. I completely forgot um, about that. But yeah, go on, continue. And <laughs> yeah, it's they, they show that they can defend and they're not a bad side. Like Wolves mm. aren't a bad side. Yes, they've only got one point, but they're not They're not a bad side. So yeah, it will be a tricky game. And I, I do get what you mean. Whenever you play bottom of the league, it's like, right, they've got nothing to lose. Yeah. But when you're a player and you've lost and you've lost and you've lost, and obviously the way they've lost the weekend right at the last minute, the confidence is just like, you go, where yeah. on earth are we going to get a point from? Yeah, this, where on this earth is are we going to win? I remember having that exact sort of feeling where things are just going against you. And... You know, there's only so many times you keep getting things go against, yeah. and you think, "What do we? What, what are we doing wrong?" Yeah. And I, I remember that particularly under Potter, was, you know, when we kept dominating games and we kept losing, and we, it would look like we should be fifth in the table, wasn't it, on expected yeah. goals? But instead, we were like sixteenth, seventeenth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're thinking, but why? And I don't think anyone still to this day could probably answer that question no. why, because I mean, the amount of chances that were created back then were absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, it was as clear cut chances as you're ever going to get some yeah. of them are penalties open yeah. goals you know you yeah. couldn't have got a more easy yeah. chance in front of the goal and we'd still miss yeah. it was it's probably i think one of the most biggest anomalies in football yeah. history one but i think it's a confidence thing that, i think that this generally is it, yeah. that is a pure confidence thing and i think wolves at the moment obviously they're, they're not going to have their, their confidence levels aren't going to be sky high um but you it's always a risk when you play bottom of the league because they get yeah. right they've got really see nothing to lose and it, it's still very early on in the season. And when you say you've got nothing to lose, actually, obviously the manager, he's going to... Well, Gary O'Neill, I mean, we'll, we'll listen to Dave from Talking Wolves in a second, but Gary O'Neill's maybe getting a bit of pressure on him. Similar yeah. to Oliver Glasner up in yeah. South London. Yeah, I, I do like him as a manager. I do like Gary O'Neill as a manager. I just, yeah. And some of it, some of their luck, like he's had as well as a manager, like some of the decisions against him last season, we, we feel obviously that's another story. But yeah, it, it, you, do, you do feel from a little bit um, but yeah, well, I, it's, it's always tough when you've only picked up one point that early on, there's, there's going to be uh, heaps of pressure because they're going to look, something has to change it. Mm. Um, but it, it's difficult because they, they played well against Man City and they, they have played well. It's just like you say, haven't taken the chances, haven't scored and yeah, it's, it's never nice being no. right at the bottom. But your luck's against you. I mean, this is Dave. Yes, guys, it's Dave from Talking Wolves. Just giving my thoughts ahead of Brighton Wolves this weekend. And as you would have seen, I'm sure it's been a really difficult and frustrating and disappointing start to the season for Wolves. They're currently sat at uh, pretty much bottom of the league, winless still. Um, strangely, we're not the only team that are winless, but it seems like you know the, the gap between us and the guys outside of the uh, drop zone is, is only going to get bigger and bigger. And uh, this is another tough game for Wolves, going away to Brighton, a team that have started off the season fairly positively. Well, I say fairly, very positively, you know, within the top five as we speak right now, which is a fantastic start to the season once again for you guys. I think Brighton are just a, 
a club that are going from strength to strength right now and it doesn't really matter who's in charge there you know you're seeing results you're seeing the right process you're seeing a proper football club the right recruitment and so on you know the the transition from Potter to De Zerbi was almost flawless and it looks like it might be the same with it with the new guy in charge now as well um <clears throat> you know and I think you can take that as a compliment and the, the fact that everyone oh we want to do it like Brighton why can't we we do this like Brighton, you know, and that and, and that's just, you know, kudos to, to you guys as a club. But going back to Wolves, yeah, it's been a disastrous start to the season, to be completely honest. Um, look, the, the start to the season in terms of fixtures were very tricky for us. We've played a number of the guys that are already in the sort, sort of top six, top eight of the, of the Premier League. We've now played City, Liverpool, Chelsea, Arsenal, Forest, who have started the season, Brightly, Newcastle, you know, Villa. We, we have played some really tough teams, but ultimately the quality of the performances aren't quite there and pressure is starting to mount certainly on, on Gary O'Neill now. Um, it sounds like the club are backing him as of right now. They sort of have to because they gave him a four-year contract in the summer. So they have to back him, really. Um, but I think he's probably going to get until the November international break. I think he has to has to almost try and get something out of this game. I have a little bit of hope looking at some of the games earlier in the season for you guys, dropping points at home uh, to Forest and Ipswich. So it gives me that little ounce of 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 hope. Um, and we, we're creating chances. We're having some good moments and games, but ultimately defensively, we've been defensively we've been. Really, really poor. Uh, you saw the game against Brighton just before the last international break where I think it was 5-3 in the end. You know, it was just a disastrous defensive performance. Really, really poor from Wolves. Um, you know, conceding just daft goals, conceding a lot of goals of set pieces, which ultimately got our young set piece coach sacked. Um, and typically we, we conceded a late set piece quite controversially against Manchester City. For all it's worth, I think the goal is... Um, the goal is OK uh, from John Stones, but Wolves had one that was chalked off for, for a very similar instance uh, last season, which I think is why Wolves fans are quite disappointed with it. Um, but, you know, we went in with a game plan with that City game. It almost worked. Very negative from Wolves, I suppose. But Gary O'Neill knew we had to do what what we had to do to try and get a point. Unfortunately, it didn't quite work out for us. Um, but, yeah, I think Gary O'Neill's got three games to try and save his Wolves job. This is one of them. I think he can, uh, you know, get a lot more. You know, if he gets a win or a point under his belt, pressure will be off a little bit. But our next couple of weeks are massive. We play Palace and Southampton both at Molyneux, both back to back. Um, and I'm really hoping we could try and get something out of those games because if we don't, I think Molyneux can and will turn toxic very quickly. Um, in terms of players that are, are, are doing okay for us right now, uh, Strand Larson has started off quite brightly. Um, the striker, there's some games where he's quite isolated and sort of out of the game completely, but five goal contributions, I think three goals for him now uh, in the league already for a team at the foot of the table, very decent return. Cunha, of course, can can create something out of nothing. He's got that quality. The midfield's been a little bit frustrating and disappointing. Joe Gomez, Andre and Lamina as players, fantastic footballers. Um, we saw the best of Lamina and Joe Gomez last year. Andre's come in and shown his quality, a player that was liked by a number of big clubs around Europe. But defensively, we, we've been awful. We've got a little bit of a situation with the goalkeeper department as well. Uh, Joe Saisai was our number one for the last few years, uh, sort of frozen out almost for Sam Johnston, which was a, a bit of a weird swap. Um, Joe Saisai came back in due to an, a Johnston injury on Sunday, did really well. But Gary O'Neill sort of made out that Johnston's his number one. So um, he's not really got a selection headache there. So I am intrigued. We switched to a back five against City. Are we going to stick to that? I would personally, but we'll see if he switches back to the back four against Brighton. Um, I don't know. But like I said earlier, slim amount of hope. But if I'm completely honest and realistic, I think Brighton should have enough and they've got the momentum and the quality and the confidence that they should get three points against the Wolves. Thanks for having me, guys. All the best. Please let us have three points on Saturday, but all the best for the rest of the season. And I'll catch you very soon. Love Dave. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, to be fair, I never realised the the teams they played. Yeah. It's actually when you when you look at it like that, you go, blimey, they really have been quite unlucky with the yeah. fixture list. But I think um, they actually might be one of the unluckiest teams in the league. They somehow beat yeah. us in terms yeah. of just being sheer unluckiness. As you say with the VAR <laughs> last season, it's absolutely insane. Yeah. Um but yeah, so Dave, I mean, he's right in what he says. Mm -hmm. Again, Wolves fans are frustrated at the moment. There's pressure mounting, but I guess you, you can't take too much away when you look at that fixture yeah. list. Um, it's, it's interesting to see how he talk, talks about f uh, formation-wise. He wants to go back five. Yeah. 
um, whether he'll say, sort of play that defensive role against us. Mm -hmm. Because as we said, it keeps coming up in, a, in these conversations, but the, the sort of low block, I mean, you'd imagine mm -hmm. a team at the bottom of the league will come here and try and defend. Probably. Um, yeah. and, and it's down to us to try and sort that out, isn't it? Yeah, no, definitely. And the only positive Wolves will take is obviously Man City. They defended really well, whereas obviously beforehand, clearly showing they haven't defended very well. Um, so I think that that's their glimmer of hope and they probably will go in with that sort of maybe more defensive mindset and maybe Gary Neal will look at that and be, okay, we're going to be a bit more defensive, mm. um, be a little bit solid at the back, sharp, sharp, and then they do have a lot of quality. Yeah. Forget they, they do actually have a lot of quality. This is what I'm thinking. I'm not quite writing them off. Like maybe, no. they, I know that they look like they're at the bottom of the league, but I still look at them and think, well, you've got very good players. He mentions Cunha. I mean, Cunha was, yeah. was fantastic last season. Larson started the game, um, the season off really well. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, Cunha, it's Cunha for me that always I think of as the, the man that can just sort of Bit of make magic. things happen. Yeah, bit of magic. Um, he actually reminds me a little bit of Jorginho in his own right, and that's not just because he's Brazilian. Yeah. <laughs> um, they play a similar position, but he sort of does. It's that it's that driving factor. It's the one that can sort of make things happen. Um, and against someone like us, I mean, obviously our, our mid midfield is much better now. Carlos Belaib is sort of yeah. you know really establishing himself as a starting midfielder. Yeah. Obviously Jack Hinchelwood, um, Yassine Yari, but then it's not even mentioning some of the others that we've got on the yeah, bench yeah, at the moment. Yeah. Matt Weaver. Um, so we, we are looking quite strong as a core. Um, my sort of worry, and uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, is what game plan we sort of go with. Because, you know, we, we've gone from a serious extreme to a serious extreme within two weeks. I mean, yeah. I've gone from talking about, my God, how are we ever going to stop conceding goals yeah. with this sort of high line? And I'm thinking, if this is all we've got, then we are doomed this season. Yeah. And then it's, we're going to sit back and literally park the bus. Yeah. And this it's crazy to, to put this into perspective as to how only a couple of weeks in football is, is such a long time. So much can yeah. change in such a sport, short span of time. Um, and, and what we play against Wolves, I'm not quite sure because if you're, if you're then going to pressure them, you're sort of just giving them what they want, aren't you? And you're giving yeah. them the outlet with players like they, he mentioned already. Yeah, and I think probably will be a little bit scared well not scared but a little bit frightened of the the quality that they possess um so i think you probably won't necessarily see that really high line but at the same time in possession i think you'll see that dominant brighton again mm. they, they'll want to he'll he'll want to he'll want to show the fans and he'll want to show people right you come to our home you you ain't having the ball and mm. we're we're gonna make you run and i think that that's what he's gonna do is you'll see that dominant brighton in possession of the ball and then also you'll see that ugly side. Like mm. you'll see where, again, you're coming into our home. You're not going to bully us. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna bully you by keeping hold of the football and doing that ugly side well. So I think that that's the Brighton you'll see at the weekend is right. We're gonna dominate the ball, um, make you run, and we're gonna we're gonna punish you. Yeah. But also at the same time, you've got to give them their respect because they they do have quality. Um. So I don't think necessarily you're going to see that really high line which you've been seeing a lot of this season. Um, but in possession, I think you will see that dominant Brighton again of of having a lot of possession and, like I say, a lot of probing because I believe we'll probably will set off and mm. they're going to play that that counter attack and rely on their uh, individual players for that bit of quality. Um, but yeah, I I can't see them really. I can't see them hurting Brighton. I just think you you lot have just you've been way too good and, and way yeah. too strong and 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 then proven at Newcastle that you do that ugly side well. Yeah. It's probably with a manager like Hertzler, it's important to remember he's young as well. Yeah. So he's still naive as well. He's still learning. Yeah, he's he's still learning, learning as well. So all of these factors, all of these different styles we might see yeah. are actually a little bit of trial and error. And, potentially, yeah. And maybe yeah, this season we might have to suffer with that. We might mm -hmm. prosper with that. There's yeah. probably going to be times we have a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, and that's maybe a good thing in the sense of, you know, you, you're always a little bit unpredictable. Um, whether that's good all the time, I don't know, because you obviously want to have some sort of consistency. Um, but, you know, the, the two results in which come about from Spurs to um, Newcastle are two so dissimilar results, it's ridiculous. And then the performance against Chelsea before that was completely different as well. It's, it's almost like we've got three different Brightons. It's impossible to put sort of an average metre in between. Um, so, you know, I guess the Wolves game is, th this is why I'm so sort of confused as to what's going to happen. It's the first time I've had this sort of feeling of, I actually don't quite know what we're going to do. I can sort of see, I can see where we're going to do this pressing, you know, up high. I can sort of see why we did the high line, why we might have sort of knocked that back. I think that was 
probably the right thing to do is, is cut that out a little bit, just with the personnel we've got at, at the moment. Um, but now we're sort of thinking, okay, right, we've got this defensive structure, we've got this midfield structure, and it will just be a case of learning. And, yeah. you know, we'll see what happens. Um, I'm going to ask you for a score prediction. I know it doesn't mean quite so much to you, um, yeah. but we'll see We'll see what you think. Um, I'm going to go with a 2-0 Brighton. I think, obviously, Wolves are going to be defensive, but I'm going to go 2-0 Brighton. I think you'll break, mm. you'll break them down, you'll score a goal, and then I think Wolves will eventually try and come out and then you'll you'll kill them again with another goal. And I, that's why I'm going. I think 2-0. I don't think it's going to be a, a, a big score line. I know Brighton have had a few big score lines. I don't think it's going to be a big score yeah. line. Um, I think I'm going to go 2-0. I just think you guys have just way too much quality and have, have shown defensively as well that you're solid and going forward that, uh, yeah, you just have too much quality yeah. for them. I just don't think, yeah, I don't think Wolves are... are going to have enough and, and then they're not going to be confident as well so I just yeah I can't see a, a confident yeah. Brighton being beaten by a not so confident Wolves at the mm. moment I hope you're right and I, and I hope we really as Hertzler said I don't know if you saw it but he said he wanted to make the Amex a fortress he wanted yeah. to make the Amex the place to be and I know that they always say that it's a bit of a cliche in football yeah. isn't it at this point um, but probably in his sense I get what he means mm -hmm. we probably haven't really had the Amex as the place that's hard to win um, you know, the place you don't want to come to, probably since that first season in the Premier League when Hewton was here. Yeah. And that was one one thing that Chris Hewton did so well. Away days were a write-off. <laughs> don't, yeah. don't get me wrong. Away days were a write-off. But at home, you sort yeah. of thought, okay, doesn't matter who we play, we're gonna we're gonna sort of give you a hard time yeah. and the fans will be up for it. And I think hopefully, you know, Hertzler can build that here. Um, we saw it sort of in that second half. It was a real passionate performance against yeah. Tottenham. Um, and we saw it sort of similarly in, in the uh, game against Newcastle. You know, it's a smash and grab, yeah. quite a lot of passion, a lot of energy. Uh, you see it with Jorginho particularly, absolutely loves it. Yeah, I think it's yeah. brilliant. Uh, Danny Welbeck the same. So it's that passion, it's the energy. I think that's what that's what I do like about this Hurts the side is, is the, how much fire is in sort of that team. He's got experience around him as well. Obviously yeah. with with people that have been there before, like Andrew Crofts as well. Yeah. See, I, I bet he he does actually quite a lot as well. So I, I reckon he, he's he's helping out a lot and bringing that that, that sort of different side. He, he's been at a club for quite a while now. Mm, so togetherness. He, yeah, and he's sort of trying to bring that. And I think, yeah, obviously Hertz is the main man. He's, he's probably most of the idea is going to come from him. But then he's also surrounded by a good experience, people that have, have been involved in Brighton games for the last few years and, and sort of have that bit of a feel and have been involved in the Premier League because it's very different to sort of any other leagues. Um, so yeah, I think it's, yeah, he's, he's done well by surrounding himself with good experience. So he, he can go into to these games with with a little bit of help because like I say, mm. it's, it's new to him. He's still learning, but at the same time, he's got people he can he can fall back on and who can bring that bit of experience as well. Yeah, no, Toby, a uh, legend today, top man for coming down. No, uh, down always the a pleasure. Arms, as always. Yeah. Um, make sure you come down near Brighton. Um, I looked over there because I thought the, the camera's normally slightly further over. So looking over that that much further is really odd to me. Um, but no, make sure you come down to the Caxton Arms in Brighton. Make sure you follow Toby as well yeah, um, on everything he does. We'll put it in the description, of course, as always. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe if you're on YouTube and make sure you keep streaming. Leave a review on Spotify as well. And we'll see you just after Wolves. Goodbye. <laughs>